All right. Welcome back to another episode of Two Plain Sports. Um, today, we're going to be recapping the Iowa State game, final home game, and senior night for those seniors that have been around the football team for four or five years now. Before we get into our opinions and reviewing what happened during the game, we want to let you guys know we really appreciate everything you guys have done for us so far. It's awesome to see the channel grow. Great to see the comments. Love to hear what you guys think of every game before and after it happens. And obviously those recruiting videos that we try to put up more regularly now that we have national uh, letter of intent day coming up here in the next three weeks. I believe it is December 15th. That is the first day that the high school kids can sign. And that is the class of 2022. So we should be getting a lot of um, good news here in the next few weeks for some guys that want to be early enrollees. Uh, but let's go ahead and get, get into it. This last week, Iowa State, always a hard opponent, and it still is. It was not an easy game by any means, but the Sooners were able to pull it off. They now improved to 10-1, and 7-1 and one conference record, and are still alive to be in the Big 12 championship. And it all rides on what's coming up next week. but. Let's let's go ahead and just focus on this weekend and what we saw at the Sooners against Iowa State, led by Matt Campbell and a great running back in Brees Hall. So, Brum, what, what did you think of the game overall and anything that stood out to you? Yeah, um, I mean, this is feels like a broke. I feel like a broken record. I mean, it's the same thing that we've been having all year. I believe this is the sixth game that the Sooners have won by by a touchdown or fewer points. And so, I mean, just, you know, they've won 10 games. So six out of 10 have been this close. And um, it just feels like the offense, when it's off, it's off, but the defense will make up for it. When the defense is off, the offense will make up for it. Just can't put together a full 60 minutes. I mean, this is the best I feel like the Sooners played on defense pretty much all year long. I mean, this is what we expected from day one against Tulane. Um you know, they got after the quarterback, they made Brock pretty uncomfortable, he made some poor decisions. Um, and then, you know, Lincoln Riley and the Sooners offense w flirted with the idea of committing to the run, they did a little more running. I mean, Kennedy Brooks still ran for 115 yards on 17 carries, but I feel like he really, there really wasn't a commitment to the run still. And I just, you know, I mean, surviving in advance, and I can't complain. I mean, we're ten and one. We're going rolling into Bedlam, which is, you know, you know, OSU is also ten and one as well. But I mean, with this game, I figured it was going to be close, and it just felt like another game that the Sooners just couldn't put their opponent away. Like they just let them hang around, hang around, hang around, and then the last minute have to make the final couple plays to to win the game, and they did it. Eventually, it's going to run out. I just feel like we're just like against Baylor, they finally caught up to him. But I feel like if you let Oklahoma State hang around, it's going to – or someone else, it's going to eventually bite you. Um, but I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah, it, it was frustrating to say the least. It really seems like Lincoln Riley is, is buying into his own hype. We've, we said it a couple videos ago. He just is – being way too stubborn, or at least more stubborn than usual with his, like, it seems like he doesn't have a desire to run the ball. It didn't, they didn't start running the ball until pretty late in the second half. And that's when the offense really started looking good again. You know, like you said, Kennedy was so still was able to run for 115 yards, but he only had 17 carries. Caleb Williams had 12. Like I understand that Caleb can run, but it should just be a threat. We shouldn't have so many designed runs for him. This offense should look more like what Baker ran back in, you know, back in his offenses where it was a lot of play action, but we, and Ken and uh, Joe Mixon and P Ryan were really the main focus of it. We wanted, it was established in the run and then make big plays off play action. And we're just not doing it. We're still trying to force the ball downfield when the uh, defense knows we're going to try to, and it is frustrating. Um, and like you said, we're not going to put any teams away or win games that we should, just like we did. We dropped it against Baylor. If 
this offense, if Lincoln doesn't change that mindset going into Bedlam, we're probably not making the Big 12 championship. And it's going to be real frustrating. We're going to hear a lot of fans start saying, you know, Lincoln should be fired. Lincoln should just go ahead and take the LSU job, whatever. I don't agree with them, but we're going to hear it. And it's going to be frustrating to miss the Big 12 championship because we lost to our in-state rival. That being said, the defense did play amazing. Um, during our preview, we mentioned that we were we were a little intimidated at the fact that we might be so committed to the run that we were going to let uh, Hutchinson and Kolar just destroy the DBs. That didn't really seem to be a problem until the end of the game when they were you know trying to get their game tying drive. But I mean, really, for the most part, it just seemed like it was a give and take. Um, you know, obviously they're still a very talented team and they were going to get some yards on us, but it never was, it never looked like we weren't going to stop them until the end. I mean, on third down, the defense kept them to four of 18, which is probably the best they've done all year. The problem was on fourth down when they did go for it, they were five for seven. So there's still some improvement. Um, could they have been better? Yes, but it's still it's, it's gotten better since we've gotten all those guys back from injury, which is a good thing. They're all putting it together. Hopefully against OSU, they really bring it and keep those third down numbers down and hopefully just not let them go on, get it on fourth because that is going to hurt us against a team like Oklahoma State. But it was good to see. IT, um, and we were talking about it before, but going into the season, season we expected Bonito to be the guy the playmaker for the defensive line and now that he hasn't made plays but it has really been the dude to show up every single game other than again when we had a lot of injuries on the line but it was a good showing by both of them um hopefully we can put it all together though because it is frustrating that this offense can't can't score when they need to yeah and and what was even more ridiculous was i remember uh it was the fake fake punt that Iowa State ran um you know it was what they were down a couple scores and I felt like it was you know it was late in the game and they were full-on punt block or not punt block but punt coverage the Sooners were and I don't really understand why they had everyone drop out you know turn their backs and run away and the thought of Iowa State ever going for on a fake you know a fake punt never crossed anyone's mind and sometimes this the situational awareness, like what the score is, how much time's left, it's just not there sometimes. I don't know why you would be a full-on, you know, punt coverage in that situation. I mean, maybe it's easy for me to sit here and say that and, you know, in hindsight, but I just feel like, I don't know, I would have felt like I would have at least had a safety sitting there waiting to make sure that the punter didn't try to run. I mean, no one even went to the three guys in front of the punter. They just turned around and ran backwards. It, it just, I don't know. And, you know, it's, it is what it is, I guess, at this point. But I think what Lincoln Riley is doing and why he's so stubborn is because I think it's Caleb Williams is not seeing the field. There's guys open. And same with Spencer Rattler. There's guys open. They're just not seeing it. And I think that's the hardest thing for him is like, I'm like, he's thinking I'm scheming up all these plays, calling all these plays. They're open at times. They're just not throwing it in the windows. They're not seeing it fast enough. They're not doing this, but I'm going to keep doing it until they figure it out. But the problem is, especially with the true freshman quarterback, if he's not seeing it, running it more is not going to help. You just got to run the ball and, and make the defense respect it even more and get him bigger windows guys that are more open it's just you know i bet caleb williams next year at this time will be hitting those small windows and reading it faster and processing it faster it's just he's seeing defenses he's never seen before in, in high school i mean running five safe you know five defensive backs you know three safeties um you know a lot of a lot of teams in high school don't really run that and it's just different and i just think with his inexperience and we saw Spencer Rattler struggle when he was at, you know, we were at Iowa state um, last year on the road, he struggled until the very end, he started kind of getting it. And Caleb Williams just didn't, didn't start clicking for him, but Rattler at the very end, it started clicking for him. And, but then he threw a game ending pick. 
Um, you got to credit Iowa State. Iowa State is a team that we all thought that probably was going to be in the Big 12 championship with the Sooners. Um, obviously, they've had a few games not go their way and a few head scratchers here and there. But, you know, this is the first year that Iowa State had any expectations on them. And sometimes I can get get to you if you're not in that position or you're not used to being in that position. Um, you know, I mean, it was great to see it. What was it? Seven sacks uh, for the for the defense. And then, you know, the thick six, you know, with uh, Key Lawrence forced that fumble on Brock Purdy and then Jalen Redmond took it back. I mean, and, you know, I, I'm complaining about the Sooner situation awareness. I mean, I don't know what Iowa State was thinking there because that's the difference of the game right there. Um, you know, you should have taken a short pass or just not try to do too much. And that's what ended up, it ended up costing them. And that's how close the margin of victory is and victory and winning and losing is for these teams right now. And I don't think, I don't think it's going to get any different next week against Oklahoma state. Oh, no, it's not. And then, I mean, you mentioned the good things that those good big plays like the thick six and, you know, the, the turnovers, but the one thing that also went against the Sooners um, and obviously, and Iowa State benefited out of it was in that first drive. We were about to get him out on a third and long. Brock throws it deep, and Woody, no, not Woody, I'm sorry, DJ was able to break up the pass and to what seemed to be in normal time, at least an incomplete pass and maybe even a touchback, ended up becoming a fumble after a review, which I disagree with. I think it's the, I think it was a bad call. It should have just been an incomplete pass. Um, and let, let Iowa State kick a field goal, but that ended up giving Brees Hall his only touchdown of the game. And the, I, the, the Cyclones to a good start. That kind of, to me, was, it was a good, I was happy with what the defense did there. I didn't blame that score on them. What are you going to do when they're, they're at the one yard line after what should have been a, at least, forcing a field goal they did their job just the refs kind of screwed them over there but I was not feeling hot about the game when that happened because I just don't trust the offense right now the, somehow the offense is the problem in Norman Oklahoma and it doesn't make any sense and like you said it's Lincoln is giving Caleb so many reps to throw the ball down the field that he's forgetting that he has a potentially a first round running back and Kennedy Brooks, and he's not letting him do what he's what he does every time he gets the opportunity to run the ball, which is get 100 yards and put the offense in a position to score. There was um, the, the, the drive where Gabe missed the field goal, which, you know, the burrito curse has, a, has missed three field goals since kicking that burrito a couple weeks ago for his promotional, um, you know, his promotion for, I believe this was some local restaurant in Norman. He was, I'm assuming he got paid to, to do that for him, but you know, Kennedy Brooks ran the ball pretty well that drive, got us in the red zone, and then we try to throw it and get a, get a passing touchdown once we got within 20 yards and what happened. Three, three plays, three plays didn't work, then we miss a field goal. Like, if he's the hot hand, let's run the hot hand until the defense plays it, and then you know, bomb, you know, throw bombs out of the field when when Mims has one on one coverage. There was also times where where Caleb was just missing high, or even if he completed the pass, the guys had to really reach for it. There's one play I remember. I think it was in the first quarter, or at least the first half. He rolled out to the right and hit Woods, but Woods had to like lay out for it and almost missed the catch where if he just puts it right in in the right spot he probably could have gained another five ten yards after the catch and that just thinks that Caleb needs to improve and freshman mistakes more than likely but there, there's little things that can be improved with Caleb right now but really it should just be put on Lincoln Riley if you can't if you're being too stubborn like that and letting letting your freshman make freshman mistakes then you're not trying to win. You're just trying to make him as a quarterback look better and in some way yourself to continue this quarterback guru 
title that you've carried over the last four or five years. And that should that shouldn't be a motivator. I don't. I'm not saying it is 100, but it seems to be with how stubborn he is and not running the ball. Yeah, and you know one of the other good things that stood out to me was on the defense, and you know the defense also played really well. You know with the sacks and the pressure, but what I was really excited about what I saw was the short distance short yardage, how they, how they stopped them. And I remember in the third quarter, it was like third and one, they stuffed them fourth and one stuffed them again. And they turned the ball over on downs. You know, a lot of times it seemed like whenever this, you know, an opponent got to fourth and one, you know, fourth and two or third down or whatever, anything that was short, all they had to do was run up the middle and they were going to get it every time. But it seemed like, man, you know, Redmond and Co and Winfrey and and whatnot really were hitting hitting the holes and and making sure that they weren't going to get through. And I mean, and that's you know, it all goes back to that four four for eighteen. I think you said on third down, but a lot of times that that third and short or fourth and short was just it's not a good spot for the Sooners. It seems like it's almost automatic every time. And finally, you could you saw a, a stop. Um, another thing, you know, Winfrey, he played really well. I mean, obviously he had that nasty hit that Brock Purdy was holding the ball too long and he was coming back to the middle. And then before he knew it, he was getting laid out by Winfrey. And that seemed to be kind of a re- reoccurring issue with Brock Purdy holding on, holding on to that ball way too long. And he ran into some, some issues between getting hit like that, that fumble, um, just, you know, getting stacked. It was, he's just holding on to the ball way too long. And I'm surprised that they didn't go to Charlie Kolar earlier in the game. I felt like that was an advantage for them. And I feel like everyone knew that. And he just, they just never went to it until the very last drive or two uh, until they had to have it. Um, You know, they went free. He, he, he played well, but I think what really bugged me was his personal foul. And I understand the emotions and it is what it is. And he, you know, he threw the ball at the player and then he came to the sidelines and I just saw Lincoln Riley just kind of talking with him. I'm sure Lincoln said, no, don't do it again. But man, I feel like sometimes I I watch some coaches like Nick Saban, he might've spiked his headset after a penalty like that. He really might've, because I felt like I might be wrong, but I feel like that was like going to be third and long or something like that, or second and long, that, it was going That was a stop on third, on third down. Okay. Where they got okay, pretty yeah. much got, the defense in a way gave away a turnover. Okay. Yeah, that, so, uh, yeah, like that, I, I would have loved to have seen, I mean, just because you yell at some players about a dumb personal foul doesn't mean they're going to lose that intensity. I feel like that's what Lincoln Riley is worried about, is if he starts chewing these guys out about these dumb personal fouls, which – they have gone down this year ever since Bookie has left. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like you, you've got to you've got to walk that fine line. But I feel like you got to let them know every single time if they make a dumb play, it, that's just stupid. I mean, I, I don't know. It just little things like that, and you know, you, little thing there, little thing there, and it all adds up, and it can cost you in the end because it's just you would have gotten off the field better. And if they would have, you know, if they drive down the field, then boom, there's seven points right there for you that you shouldn't have ever let up. And I don't know, just little things like that, that, that really bugged me. Yeah. Um, I think that might even go to the, probably the criticism that we've really been seeing around Lincoln this year is he's being pretty soft with his players. Like you're not doing these kids a favor by not getting onto them in those situations. It's, and it's not just that individual, it's kind of setting a tone for your team. If you aren't willing to set, to chew the kid out over something dumb that potentially could have costed you the game. And obviously that was really early on and they ended up winning, but you just can't have those kinds of things happen and you can't let him just slide off and with a slap on the wrist for it. Like that's just not all right either. You're not preparing him for the pros. If Perry, Perry on the guy that could potentially be professional um, at the next level. And if he does something dumb like that and it's consistent, he's not going to see the field often or his coaches are going to be yelling at his ass as 
a millionaire and he's just going to be like, I don't, I'm not going to take this. I make just as much money, if not more than you screw it. And then he's going to be useless in the pros. You got to get onto him. And if you have thin skinned guys like that, that's not someone that probably going to be sticking around very long. And that's okay. The reason Alabama is so great is because those guys are for the most part, pretty thick skinned. You don't see too many guys that are starters of Alabama or French starters leave to go start somewhere else. They're okay with working their asses off to get on the field. And two, it improves the team overall. You're going to see less dumb mistakes like that more than likely. You're going to see guys step up to the plate and correct each other because that's important. You need that. You need the guys to have accountability for each other. When as a team, lose as a team, you know, the, the stereotypical thing. And that's just, I don't know. I, I don't like that he didn't get onto him. I'm not sure how everyone else feels, but you got to just throw your shit down and turn red in the face because that is a frustrating move. Yeah. And, you know, going back to the Charlie Kolar, um, you know, I just can't believe they didn't go, go at him, you know, go to him quite often, you know, earlier in the game. I mean, he ended the game with 12 catches, 152 yards and a touchdown, but I felt like the last maybe hundred yards was within the last two drives um, that they were just really on a two minute drill. Um, It was, it was kind of mind boggling to me how long it took Grinch to double cover uh, Charlie Kolar. Like I felt like the double coverage wasn't there until that, fourth down play where pat fields got the interception and i i don't know why you knew that he was going to charlie kolar you saw it like five straight times he was going right to him just running over the middle and just nothing was changing um they had some timeouts i don't know why they wouldn't call a timeout and get into you know get lined up correctly um but they finally did and they made the plays when they had to and um you know i i'm I mean, it looked the team. I mean, it was a good win, solid win. Um, you know, this team last year probably wouldn't have won it. You know, with the defense last year, especially two years ago, uh, the defense has definitely won a handful of games this year for the Sooners, which we haven't been able to save in a long time. So, you know, there's a lot of growing pains. I really think next year is going to be the 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 next and final step. Uh, you're going to have the defense there. The offense will be better. Uh, but not looking too far ahead. But, you know, the Sooners won, you know, a handful of teams ahead lost, you know, Oregon lost. Um, you know, if they take care of business next week and then they take care of business at the Big 12 Championship, they're going to have a case to probably be in the playoffs and probably play Georgia. And I am not overly excited about that matchup to draw Georgia in the first round, but I don't know. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I know people, when we first said it a couple weeks ago, uh, or I guess after the loss, people were not happy about it. In the comment section, people on Twitter just don't think it's even possible, but it's there. We we said it. I mean, we need a lot of things to happen, go our way. And the things that needed to happen this week did happen. Oh, Oregon lost big against Utah, which they were already underdogs, and it just it didn't look good couldn't do anything offensively and Utah just took advantage of that destroyed their defense and Michigan State got whooped by Ohio State so at this point the only thing that's fair to say is Ohio State is probably going to be in the playoffs at the number three or four spot Cincinnati will be a top four team more than likely in this week's rankings and the last thing that Oklahoma needs to happen is Alabama gets beat at some point I think at this point, uh, that's the last obstacle. And it'll be what the committee thinks. If Alabama does lose in the SEC championship, then will it be a two-loss Alabama team that lost in the SEC or a potentially potentially a one-loss Oklahoma team that's a Big 12 champion? And who is it between? Because the Pac-12 is eliminated, and there's not any other Big 10 team that will probably deserve it at that point if Ohio State does went out, beat Michigan, and then the Big Ten Championship. So Oklahoma's got a shot. We just need a couple more things to happen. Yeah, I mean, there's 
you know, they're going to have to play. Cincinnati's going to have to play Houston in the AAC championship. Houston is 10 and one. Houston's not a joke. And I think they're like 19th in the AP poll. So even if, say, Cincinnati does win out, Alabama loses, Michigan loses, OU beats, um, you know, Oklahoma State twice. Really, it's going to come down to is it's going to be Georgia, Ohio State, and then there's going to be two spots between three teams if Cincinnati wins out. Cincinnati, Oklahoma, and Notre Dame. I think Cincinnati, Cincinnati would get it. I think Cincinnati would get in because they beat them. And then I think a one-loss conference champion against a one-loss non-conference champion would get in over, you know, would get in over Notre Dame because Notre Dame has a one against a ranked team since Wisconsin, like week three. Yeah. And so I, you know, really what would pave the path is if Cincinnati lost in the AAC championship game, and then there would literally be no debate, then OU and Notre Dame would slide right in and, um, and that would be it. But having Oregon lose was the big, big time deal. Oh, yeah, definitely. It'll be interesting to see. I mean, do you want to give your, your prediction? Where do you think Oklahoma is going to be ranked uh, uh, in this week's? In the, in the playoffs coming up? Mm-hmm. Uh, with Wake Forest also losing, I mean, I would imagine the Sooners are going to be nine. I think I'm going to say nine. I think they'll be ahead of Ole Miss. Um but they might not be. They're either going to be nine or ten. Uh, Baylor will still be ahead. Oklahoma State will be ahead. I think one, it's going to be um, Georgia. Two is going to be Ohio State. Three, um, Alabama. You're going to put four. Probably going to put um, put Michigan in at four. Five, Cincinnati. Six will probably be um, – might be Oklahoma State. Might be six for Oklahoma State. Seven was it Baylor, I think. And maybe uh, I might be missing a team. I can't quite remember. Um, oh, and Notre Dame, Notre Dame might be seven, Oklahoma State eight, Baylor nine, and maybe us ten. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see where they how much they value that Iowa State win. Yeah. What about you? So I think one and two, or actually Georgia will be one. I think after this week, Ohio State should be put at two. They won't be, but they should be. Alabama at three. Cincinnati will be bumped up to four because of Oregon's loss. Um, then Michigan at five. Notre Dame at six. Uh, Oklahoma State at seven. I think Ole Miss will be at eight. Oklahoma at nine and Baylor at ten. And I think even though Baylor beat us. The committee has shown that a head to head doesn't really matter to them, given that Michigan State was below Michigan just a week ago, even though they beat them in a head to head. And at that point, it was really just due to their overall record. Michigan State had two losses after their loss to Purdue. And at this point, Baylor has two losses and we have one. So we'll be nine in in my head. Uh, Maybe eight if they put a lot of. a lot of weight on overall record because then Ole Miss also has two losses. So we'll see, but we'll definitely be top 10. So next week, next week's Bedlam game will be a top 10 matchup and potentially big 12 championship could be a top 10 matchup. Yep. So uh, the, the Sooners are sitting in a good spot. They just have to handle their business in the next two weeks. Yeah. And convincingly, I think that's what would put us over Notre Dame at this point because brand at this point is equal and, the committee loves putting Notre Dame in right now. Yeah, for sure. Cool. For sure. So, do you have anything else before we wrap it up? No, it's going to be, it's going to be a different bedlam this year. I feel like a um, lot more defense and um, it's going to be who can make the fewer mistakes, the boneheaded plays, and it's going to be, it's going to be a close one. So we'll yeah. have a game preview coming up for, for that one, though. For sure. Yeah, keep an eye out. That being said, make sure you are hitting that subscribe button. And then when you do that, hit the notification bell so that you know when our preview does come out. Make sure you also are hitting the like button and leave a comment. Let us know what you thought. Are you still concerned about the Sooner team? Could Do they really have a chance of making it to the college football playoffs? We think so, but some of you might not. So let us know. Um, Do that before you click out of the video. Other than that, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next time.